Tip one, Dobry Vetcher, to uh, those in Ukraine. Uh, good afternoon and good morning to uh, to the Americans. And uh, uh, good night, probably, to some people listening uh, far in, in the Far East. Um, we have um, uh, one little thing we're adding tonight, and that's why it took us a second to get started. And uh, hopefully that goes smoothly. A bit of breaking news, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, but uh, I want to welcome everyone to, to this evening's Lviv Lab format of the 2021 Integral Human Development Conference. My name is Joe Lindsley, uh, and I guess as most of you know now, I'm an American who initially got stuck here. I came here for the conference a year ago, and uh, I'm still here and uh, happy to be in Ukraine and working with a great group of people, especially with the folks at the Ukrainian Catholic University. Uh, I first heard about the university watching an advertisement uh, for my alma mater, Notre Dame, a few years ago during a football game. And uh, so it's great. It's great to be here now to, to be part of this uh, uh, educational ecosystem. Uh, this conference is produced by the Ukrainian Catholic University in Lviv and co-hosted by inst uh, institutions and institutes at Georgetown University in Washington, Notre Dame in South Bend and the Angelicum in Rome. Today on the third conference day, uh, there, really every panel throughout the day has focused on human rights. Uh, and most of the discussion today was looking at human rights in, in light of the pandemic. Uh, for example, there were student debates today, uh, Oxford style debates on the, um, the goodness and the wisdom of lockdowns. Uh, and we also have discussed, uh, you know, how the pandemic has affected uh, those in impoverished nations and, and sort of uh, human rights in, in, in light of in light of this pandemic. Now for this discussion tonight. We're going to sort of step back from the pandemic proper, although it's going certainly to, to feature into the conversation. Um, we're step outside the, uh, of COVID, but we are going to look to the country where it seems that, that where the virus began and where uh, with that initial extremely strict lockdown in Wuhan provided a blueprint, um, provided a blueprint for uh, the, how the lockdowns would, uh, would work uh, throughout the world. And we, um, and sorry, our special guest is, I, I need to help our special guest. So give me one. Okay, I'm back and I'll explain why I had to do that in a second. Um, but uh, so we are uh, we're stepping back and we're, we're looking at uh, uh, specifically at China and uh, uh, the global influence of China and uh, how China's influence affect, affects human rights and, and self-determination. Uh, in in uh, maybe about April of this year, the secretary general uh, of NATO uh, warned, he, he said some allies of NATO are more vulnerable for situations where critical infrastructure can be sold out during this time of the pandemic. Uh, he didn't mention China, he didn't mention Ukraine, he did not mention countries of Eastern Europe, but it was widely considered that, that is what he was talking about. Uh, here in the ground in Ukraine, we, we've certainly seen uh, you know, increased investments from, from, from certain sectors, including from China. So it's one thing we're gonna explore today um, is you know, what, 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 what is the mission and purpose of, 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 of the Beijing government uh, and how does that affect, you know, should it affect us and, and should we care about it? Uh, so in order to have that discussion, we've assembled, um, I think, a, a fantastic panel. Uh, we are going to, um, uh, after our special guest, we're going to start with uh, uh, three amazing individuals from Hong Kong. Uh, they uh, uh, led by Sixtus Baggio. Uh, Baggio uh, was duly elected by the people in his district of Hong Kong to serve in the in the Ledge Code, the Legislative Council. Uh, and... Uh, I think uh, uh, our assistant here, Karen from from Georgetown, uh, from the School of Foreign Service, Karen Sambi, will, will, she will she will as I talk, she will share uh, some links in the chat, so you guys can can look at these later or take a look at them now. But Baggio, when he entered the the, the ledge code to take his oath of office, um, he was refused uh, his seat, and uh, he it is said that he mispronounced the name of China and insulted uh, the Beijing regime, and uh, he was refused his seat. Uh, that got him into a lot of trouble. Uh, five years later, he ended up in jail, and uh, and and then somehow, quite luckily, and we're gonna we're gonna hear the story of his escape uh, last December uh, from from Hong Kong to the United States. 
Uh, we're also joined by his colleagues, Daniel Wong in Washington and Simon Chang in London. Simon also suffered much abuse at the hands of uh, the Beijing regime in Hong Kong, but he was able to flee to London and Daniel Wong is in Washington. They are the co-founders of the Hong Kong Shadow Parliament Initiative. Then we will hear from Alexandra Gazala Tirzu, uh, a friend of mine for, for some years, and she's a head of research at the Singularity Group and senior non-resident fellow at the Atlantic Council. Uh, she's got her master's in philosophy and her, uh, and, and her doctorate from the University of Oxford. And uh, she will discuss China's ideological influence in Africa. She's the author of Africa and China, how Africans and their governments are shaping relations with China. Uh, and we will hear from Arthur Karitonov, the Ukrainian founder of the Free Hong Kong Center. Uh, and he will help us uh, analyze current Chinese campaigns in Europe. The reason why I'm introducing everyone now is because uh, I, the, the, the panelists have been welcomed to, as I interviewed the guests, to jump in if they have any pertinent questions. Uh, we were going to be joined this evening by, uh, by Drew Pavlov, who is uh, in, in, in Brisbane, and he's an Australian human rights activist uh, and a former student senator at the University of Queensland. Last summer, uh, he began to, um, when, uh, I'm sorry, in the summer of, uh, of 2019, uh, before the, 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 the coronavirus crisis, uh, the people of Hong Kong were uh, making great moves to, to, to push away from Beijing. And uh, Drew led student protests uh, at the University of Queensland and this amazing story uh, has, has sort of been developing that all, at Australian universities, there's not free speech. And uh, if you speak out against uh, China, you can you can get into trouble. Uh, we wanted to hear from Drew tonight, uh, but he has been facing a lot of difficulties. He's in legal battles. Uh, they kicked him out of his university. And uh, and so uh, I talked to him today and he's facing exhaustion. And especially in this time of the virus, we got to keep our health up. So we will have to arrange a conversation with him at a later date. Uh, but I wanted to mention him and I want you all to be aware of him. Uh, you can follow us, uh, Lviv Lab, on Facebook, and we'll announce any future events like that. Um, and now I can ask, uh, M Melanie, have you joined us? Yes, as a matter of fact, I have. Melanie, welcome. Um, and now I will, I will introduce you. We, we are going to begin uh, with, with, with a, a, a small um, uh, side, side uh, discuss brief side discussion here, no more than five minutes, but very relevant uh, to the matter of human rights. Uh, in, uh, on Tuesday, I think it was Tuesday night here in Lviv, there were thousands of, of protesters uh, on the main square, just a few blocks from, from where I am right now. And they were protesting the, uh, the, uh, the, a prison sentence that had just been handed down that day to uh, uh, um, uh, an activist in, in, um, in Odessa. Uh, and, uh, I, and we will, anyone will correct me on my pronunciations, but uh, uh, Sergei Starnenko. And... Uh, he was sentenced to seven years, and uh, and it, it, the case seems to be sort of that he had everything against him from the from the authorities and and other figures in Odessa uh, simply for for, for his uh, free speech on his popular YouTube channel where he's got two hundred thousand followers, um, and uh, and so we wanted to get the scoop on on why he's in jail and what's going on and why the past week there have been protests, uh, little mini you know mini Maidans. Uh, uh, throughout, throughout this country. And uh, so to get the scoop on that, and I think I, I love the fact that we're going to hear this story because e we, even after Euro Maidan, there's still a problem here and things need to be addressed. And so I love the fact that we had the Hong Kongers here to, to be a part of this conversation as well. So now I'm not going to talk much more anymore because we're going to listen to uh, what everyone else has to say. But we're going to start with you, Melanie. Uh, Melanie Podolak, did, did, I did I pronounce your name correctly? Yeah, Podolak works fine, yeah. Greetings. Well, Melanie, thank you for joining us from Kiev. Now, you have been a friend of, of Sergei and, and his girlfriend for a few years. And so you're, you're a media consultant um, by, uh, you know, that's your profession. But your passion now is helping your friend uh, get out of this mess and, and helping him, uh, you know, spread spread his message. So can you tell us first who, who Sergei is and, and how he got into the situation? Um, thank you very much. So, um, friends, uh, for people who don't know, Serhii um, is a Ukrainian 
used to be Odessa-based activist, and his main concern had to do with criticizing and fighting uh, pro-Russian uh, politicians as well, because Odessa is a very complex region. So the criminality and the local government authorities and the police are deeply intertwined within the region. So basically, he had a you know, had to fight on all the fronts. And he was opposed to pro-Russian policies. I mean, the mayor of Odessa currently holds a Russian citizenship. Uh, moreover, there, he was an active participant in the Euromaidan uh, revolutions and whatnot. Um, and so he was one of the people who actually helped uh, uh, the city of Odessa not becoming, uh, you know, a battlefield for Russian-Ukrainian war the way we see it in the east of Ukraine. So he was basically, um, he was mostly concerned with, as I said, pro-Russian narratives, uh, also the illegitimate illegal constructions in the cities, uh, on the places of, uh, you know, public gatherings and whatnot. But what happened was, um, he does have a YouTube channel, which has been highly successful in, in, you know, on that front. What happened was uh, he was attacked three times, and all three attacks we ha- do have evidence. They were commissioned by um, the uh, uh, Odessa Regional um, uh, Council head, so like the mayor of Odessa, in, in, in so in, in collaboration with with the police. Uh, he was attacked first on the seventh of February two thousand eighteen, where he was he was with his girlfriend during all three attacks. They were beaten with with bats in the car and he was severely injured then on the may 1st 2018 he was shot in the back of the neck and uh, he actually did uh commit a citizen arrest of his the perpetrator however that has not the court case has not been successful as of now yeah, and, and Melly, so we only have a, a minute more but he, he was shot with a rubber bullet and but he and he uh was able to fight back he was able that, yeah to uh, subdue him and, and yeah, and we we will share with everyone too because there needs to be a lot of reporting done on this because because there's a lot of you know detail because yeah, sure. there there was a famous case where uh, he in self in self def- he was there was an assassin after him yeah so and, third, and third, two assassins third attack yeah he had two assassins yeah. attack him and he, then he one of them uh, I mean I'm sorry to say that but died uh, and that was self defense mm-hmm. case and coming back to what happened so because the local authorities and government authorities have seen that they have are, are having big trouble with trying to pin a murder charge on him during that trial. What they did, they pulled out an old case from 2015, which was basically based on far-fetched facts. And what happened was, because we do have analysis from lawyers, you can read it on his page, we're posting there all the time. So basically, they took that case, which is a non story, which might as well have been written in crayon. Uh, and um, he was sentenced to seven years in prison for that. Uh, so as of now, uh, we are going to have more uh, protests uh, in that regard. We're going to, uh, we, we will basically, we will not stop. That's the very point until he's out of jail. And most people criticize us for not directing our uh, anger at the people responsible. So the judiciary system, the whatnot. However, we do have a president who's a guarantor of the constitution. So we, we, uh, we do not care at this point. So our friend who is in jail, by the way, he's in jail in Odessa, where obviously the criminality is being controlled by the state, uh, mm-hmm. the state uh, government. So we do believe that he is in danger in jail. And so we need him out. It's not, it's not a point of, you know, like, you know, it's about justice. And it's about keeping our friends mm-hmm. safe. It's about keeping a, a person who is fighting for Ukraine's independence for years now. It's a matter of keeping him safe and, and, and sound and out of jail. Great. Hey, Melanie, thank you so much for sharing that with us. And, and I, I hope that you know people can start doing their own research and, and we can get some more reporting on this topic. But oh, please do follow and, our official yeah. page, Sternanko's official page, and then also his YouTube channel. Please, please put that in the chat and then so people can follow it. Uh, we'll directly. do that. And uh, Melanie, thank you very much. And now... Um, we're going to move to to the Hong Kong segment. So, uh, and um, now we return to our Hong Kong friends, um, uh, Baggio, uh, Daniel, and Simon. Uh, and just a, a note, uh, Simon and Daniel, they, they have launched uh, the Free Hong Kong Democrats Movement. Their idea is to make a shadow government. And so far, 17 legislators from the U.S., U.K., and Canada, Australia uh, have signed their petition. So they're trying to build momentum. But first, uh, let's start. Um, uh, Baggio, what... Um, if you if you could tell us what is the um, uh, I need to start with this day you know your day of escape and and when you left Hong Kong did you know that you know I mean you knew what you were doing that this was you were you were leaving for a long time and and walk us through 
what happened that day? Yes, uh, I'm Ba Xiu. So uh, I'm a former legislator who was elected by the people of Hong Kong back in 2016. And one of the first bill that was forcefully disqualified by the Chinese Communist Party from our local parliament. And then I was charged an awful assembly, which respectively for entering the parliament chamber as well after I was disqualified from the body that I had been elected to. And then I was jailed for a month for such a ridiculous so-called crime. And when I, when I got released in September 2020, I noticed that some people were always following me. We had no idea who they are, but judging from experience, that usually was a bad sign that being on the regime's radars again, and nothing good follows. Uh, that's Hong Kong right now. I would say the, that is a, like a city of white terror under the evil CCP regime. And that's the reason why I'm here, because I no longer feel safe at home. And, uh, what, and, but, and, and your actual escape was, was sort of, I mean, it, it was not so dramatic, right? You were, you were surprised. You were, able, you were able just to get on a plane and go. Is that correct? Yes, uh, the, the, the story is normal. Actually, I bought the airline ticket three hours before the departure as late as possible to make sure it is secure. And then after I bought the uh, uh, airline ticket, I go to the airport. Uh, there's some strange person in, in Hong Kong app, airport that that uh, but that is somehow a new normal in, in these days. But uh, finally, I, I I I can get into and and then and then now I'm in Washington D.C. And can can you describe? Was there? I mean, because from afar, watching the events of 2019, you know, you still had. Well, I mean, you, you personally were living in sort of this white terror, you know, with people following you around. But you still had freedom of speech. You still had some rights. Uh, and what was the like? To, to correct me, if that's a tell me if that's a correct assessment of it. But and it seemed that you had a chance. You know, something you guys were building towards something. I don't know what it was. And then all of a sudden, everything changed. Maybe with the virus, or was it with the the introduction of the security law? But but tell us about how. Things have changed in the past in the past year, past two years. Actually, in 2019, I think uh, most of you know that Hong Kong do have a uh, rank of uh, protest movement uh, to against the, the extradition bill amendment. Uh, but uh, both the pandemic and also a new launch a uh, national security law in Hong Kong give the movement a big hit and give Hong Kong is a big hit as well. But the pandemic basically shut down all um, activities in, in Hong Kong. And also the national security law actually grant the government powers to establish uh, national security agents forces in, in Hong Kong lawfully. And also if they arrest any people in Hong Kong, uh, they can ban you from leaving Hong Kong before they, they they put it, the case onto into the court. So basically, uh, the law grant uh, Hong government powers to ban any people in Hong Kong to leave. And um, from experience, like some well-known activists, uh, Agnes Chow, Joshua Wong, before they were arrested, they will be followed by someone. And so that's why I mentioned um, uh, uh, Usually, if there was a sign that being on regime's radars again, being followed by someone who you don't know, that is usually bad news in Hong Kong right now. And this we is, um, I would say, uh, a bit normal life that are facing daily uh, by every Hong Kongers. And when, when you ran for office, did, did you think that things would turn this bad this quickly? You know, what was that a surprise that, 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 that you're in this situation now? Actually, from starting from 2014, we have an umbrella movement, and in 2016, we have a visual revolution. Uh, uh, in the past few years, I would say that Hong Kong situation go. Uh, go worse at, at a really quick speed and even quicker uh, than most of our expectation. Uh, 
And and National Security actually is the last big hit that that uh, uh, OCCP do. What CCP do is simply uh, destroy everything in Hong Kong, destroy the system, and destroy the the goodwill that Hong Kong as a financial center in the common world. And so this is one of the last big hit that that CCP do to Hong Kong right now. And let's uh, uh, also bring uh, Daniel and Simon into it, because here we can talk about. I mean, you have an enormous challenge, but what, 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 what is your game plan? What's your objective? What do you got? You like Daniel and Baggio? You're in Washington now. What are you trying to do? And, and Daniel, maybe you want to answer answer that. Sure. So basically, what we are seeing here of uh, the the anti extradition movement in Hong Kong has been remarkable. I think it's uh signifies not only about you know the Hong Kong protests, you know, or Hong Kong versus China, or you know, or even U.S. versus China. It's a battle between dignity and authoritarianism. It's a battle between liberty and tyranny here. So uh, what we are seeing here that that like you know, I have been here in D.C. since um. 2018. So uh, about six months since I I've stayed here, like you know, I um there was a one million march a march in Hong Kong, uh against the extradition protest here. And then uh we have, I I've met a lot of like my activists in Washington D.C. And then uh they actually co-founded an organization called D.C. for HK. I was a member of that, of that as well. And then at the time there's actually uh, a lot of different global cities, like 50, 60 global cities, marched in line with the Hong Kong protests as well. I remember on the day um, on um, July, uh, on June 16, 2019, there were actually 2 million marched on the street protesting against this law, the, anti- the extradition law here. So imagine in Hong Kong, there's only 7 million p- sit, uh, people, population in Hong Kong. Two of every seven people marched on the street protesting against a specific law here. We once thought that would be successful because uh, at the time we have a slogan saying that like if if we if we burn, you burn with us. However, with the sweeping national security law here, uh, you know, which was you know uh, enacted in Hong Kong uh, back in July 2020, there has been a, a suppressive crackdown of the Hong Kong pro-democracy movement. Uh, I remember actually a, a lot of different Hong Kong stars for around the globe. We have not given a fight here. In uh, in America alone, a lot of different advocacy groups have have been you know advocate, advocating some bills in relate uh, in support of Hong Kong freedom. For example, in November um, 2019, the uh, the Congress actually passed the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act. In July, the Congress also passed the Hong Kong Autonomy Act. So we see that. Hong Kong issue has always been a bipartisan issue that's have both uh, the support of both sides, both aisles of, of, uh, of, of, of the crap Congress here. Mm. So uh, we are thinking what we can do here. So um, at first, uh, we talk, uh, I, for, for myself, I established an organization uh, with uh, other like my edifice called uh, Hong Kong for US because we are thinking how do we repay our gratitude to this country in standing up. Instead of for freedom here, so basically we uh we actually crowdfunded about three hundred thousand uh, US dollars within thirty seven days. We call uh, and then we use those money to purchase the surgical masks and PPEs and distributing distributing around the medical workers and hospitals around this, across this country. We call this a citizen diplomacy here. We also uh co-founded an organization called Hong Kong Professional Network, which was basically the the, uh, the organization for Hong Kong diaspora. But most recently, uh, me and Simon, uh, we are actually uh, good friends back then because we were classmates back in London School of Economics. Uh, we were studying international relations at the time. So by the time um, when he got his asylum in the UK, I was in the US front and he was in the UK front. And we were thinking what we can collaborate together in face of this sweeping national security law. So at the time we have founded the, uh, we have founded the Hong Kong Shared Parliament. Well, um, just give you a, a news, basically just three days ago. Um, the District Council in Hong Kong, which is actually the f- last outpost of Hong Kong democracy, has you not know, been suppressed because they, the requirement required those uh, uh, legislators who have public mandate to preach allegiance to the Communist Party. Basically, we do wait, not- if I could say, be, be, because because they, they never let people like Baggio into the parliament. Right. And so it's not it does not represent the people you're saying. 
Well, uh, what Biology has strong would be the lucky legislature, the Hong Kong Legislative mm-hmm. Council. And right now it has been fully suppressed. The people have been disqualified mm-hmm. and those people who run for candidates has been arrested. Now we do have some regional district uh, dist- council in Hong Kong, which do have the full democratic body. This is actually the last outpost, but which was also suppressed as well. So basically, with the draconian national security law, we do not see there will be any form of democratic platform in Hong Kong. And that's why the Hong Kong Shadow Parliament comes into place, because we were to provide the only democratic platform for Hong Kongers all around the globe. For people like, you know, activists like Ba Jiu Leung, who were the, the, the former legislator, and the only former legislator who is seeking asylum in the United States could also run for the election for the Hong Kong Shadow Parliament. And we also welcome, you know, a lot of activists around the globe to also run for the election as well, because we want to provide a public mandate to them. And also, uh, we do welcome people from all, all Hong Kongers from all over the globe, including he, the Hong Kongers in Hong Kong, to have the right to vote for the own candidate through the Hong Kong Shadow Parliament as well. I would have to say this is a very unprecedented, and we are trailblazer in organizing this because we are actually collaborating with different uh, internet VP and companies with their technical technical capacity to provide a free and secure me- uh, method for people mm. to vote for the for the uh, uh, for the uh, 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 for the politicians as well. But what I think is very remarkable that we do see there's more up uh, more and more asylum seekers in Hong Kong, from Hong Kong, who are going to other countries. And we do see anticipate there will be overwhelming Hong Kong's immigration to all over the world in light of this lifeboat sink scheme. Like in US, they will be discussing Hong Kong Safe Harbor app. UK, they've already opened yep. the door for millions of BNO holders as well. So I think they will, this will be successful and a lot of people will also we welcome them to join the cause to sustain our political participation as well. Because it seems that yeah, as more and more people hopefully are able to 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 get out, unfortunately, of Hong Kong, this structure will be created, uh, and, and sort of it reminds me of the great tradition of shadow parliaments, you know, during during the Iron Curtain during World War II, and uh, so and we want to. It's another big thing we need to follow and learn more about. If we could bring uh, uh, Simon in, uh, also from London, uh, or from London, uh, and uh, to to hear. Um, your take on you know what, what what how you're advancing this idea uh, in London that would be great, um, Simon. Yeah, so uh, thanks for uh, for the invitation. Um, actually, now in the UK, uh, we are quite busy on receiving over you know suspected thousands of millions of people if they're supposed to come to the UK. And previously, we also set up the groups for those people. Uh, who may seeking asylum in here. So that would be a long-term landscape, uh, what we can think, how to keep the flame of democracy, which is we have to recognize that the, those people now living in Hong Kong, they need to take greater risk uh, ever uh, to achieve democracy. So we, we are thinking right after 2019, quite many new Hong Kongers groups that have a strong sense of identity have been set up overseas. We need to keep continuous to build the desperate community around the world. So that's why at this moment, I'm also focusing on setting up the expat groups in the UK. The name is Hong Kongers in Britain. And of course, that the shared parliament at this moment uh, to be honest, like the spotlights of the news and most of the people are concerned is how to seek asylum, how to leave the place they regarded as the dangerous. And we gradually feel the fatigue happening in Hong Kong. And that naturally that's they were a little bit, you know, doubtful and even skeptical to see, you know, whether Hong Kong was uh, whether Hong Kong should have parliament works or not. But we receive over thousands and uh, the public submission feedback. And we understood, you know, the major parties from Hong Kong, and then they both quite supportive. They would feel, well, no matter you like it or not, but there's no another, another way. So we, that is the things that we should try. So that's why uh, we have this kind of idea, and we wanted to push it. And at this moment, just as Daniel said, uh, we are 
uh, in talk with the uh, NGOs to seek the funding opportunities, and also we're in talk with the VPNs and cybersecurity companies to be more uh, technically prepared, which is make it more deliverable. We are moving on from the concept mm -hmm. level, which is most of us most of us agree that we should do something, but how to deliver to make sure those people back in Hong Kong could be safely to vote. That will be the issue we're working on. Great, Simon, thanks. And we're gonna uh, go over to uh, Alexander now in a moment, but I, I, I want, and then as we, uh, when we bring Arthur in after that, we can talk about, um, uh, bring, we'll bring everyone back into conversation. Uh, so think of some questions we all wanna ask each other, but uh, we all, I also wanna, in that segment here a bit about how your families are doing back home and, and, and what that struggle is like, um, especially given your high profile. Uh, so, so we'll look into that. And then we'll hear the story of how uh, Ukraine, and Euromaidan uh, influenced um, uh, Hong Kong as well, um, despite what we just heard about is happening in, in Odessa. But uh, with that, uh, can we uh, we'll, we'll switch over to to you, Alexandra, in in Switzerland, and um, and uh, uh, Alexandra uh, has you know a, a varied career doing many things, but uh, she has spent a lot of time studying uh, Africa and in particular Chinese influence in Africa, and she's she's got a book about it and. Uh, you know, Africa, we haven't heard much about that continent in most media about, you know, during the COVID time. And we certainly haven't uh, heard much about Chinese influence there um, through its uh, Belt and uh, Roads Initiative. But now I will give, uh, Alexander, I'll give you the floor. And uh, uh, hello from Lviv to, to, to Switzerland. <laughs> Thanks so much, Joe. It's an honor to be part of this important conversation. And uh, yeah, I'll um, maybe sh shift shift the, the dialogue slightly from to a, a bit of a policy uh, policy discussion around uh, some of China's ideological uh, ideological influence, ideological uh, initiatives across the the African region, which is a region that I've been studying for. Uh, the better part of the last decade, if not if not longer, I may be dating myself a little bit. Um, but I want to uh, maybe frame the conversation actually uh, from the perspective of Africa's significance uh, to China, because I think that'll help us grasp some of the reasons um, for and the contours of some of Beijing's ideological influence in the region. And there's, of course, a lot of lot to unpack. Um, but I'll maybe highlight just a few points. And the first being, and I think that this is more, more broadly applicable, that in the West, uh, when it comes to addressing the various challenges that China poses, the thinking that we see coming out of Washington or the thinking that we often see coming out of Brussels tends to be quite siloed and quite bilateral. So far, there isn't a clear China strategy that would be embedded in a broader regional strategy or even a, a more global strategy. On both sides of the, of the Atlantic, the issue is still somewhat treated in isolation. And this is very different from how Beijing thinks. Um, Beijing, and especially since she assumed the presidency, has a kind of developed a global strategy, which uh, I would argue quite simply involves chipping away at various tenets of the Western liberal democratic order. And I think we have to be quite clear about that. And with that in mind, Beijing's efforts, whether it's respect with respect to the US or to Europe, or in this case, Africa, they're all intertwined. Um, so for Beijing, there isn't a specific US-China policy per se. There is an approach to dealing with the United States that fits and helps a broader, uh, advance a broader policy agenda. And the same is true with respect to other regions. And in this context, Africa becomes important in the first instance as diplomatic partners. So like any other country, if China wants to achieve its, its broader policy aims, it needs alliances. And historically, African states have shown themselves to be quite laudable partners. Already back in the 1950s, soon after the establishment of the PRC, around the time of many African lib liberation movements, Beijing was already courting African leaders. You had the Bandung Conference in 55, which was the first encounter between communist China and many of the newly independent African states. And that event really laid down the parameters of, of the relations, um, some of which continue today, if, if only in, in rhetoric alone. But in Bandung, um, that you already saw this idea emerging of Beijing positioning itself in opposition to what it saw as Western imperialism and as this kind of self-defined anti-hegemonic power, which for African states that were at the time emerging from decades of colonialism, this was 
understandably appealing. And without going into too much historical detail, when in 1971 China became a member of the UN Security Council, this was at least in part helped um, by the 26 African member states at the time. So with that history in mind, a big part of Beijing's recent efforts in the African region since the early 2000s have been with a similar aim. I would argue that the tactics they've shifted a bit over the last 20 years from a bit more of a purely economic and realist approach to a more normative, I would argue almost more moralistic one. But the objective of gaining African diplomatic support, it remains largely unchanged. And I would say has even strengthened over the last few years given geopol various geopol dynamics. The second reason for Africa's significance, particularly as it relates to our conversation today, is a product of its demographics. So we know it's the world's youngest continent, nearly 60% of its population uh, of the continent's population is under the age of 25. And often we tend to discuss this in the context of either its market potential and or the development challenges that it might pose. But Beijing again has a different lens on this and it sees it arguably quite rightly and it sees this, this usefulness as the next generation of leaders, political leaders, business leaders, tech entrepreneurs, and so on. And if you look at where the CCP has increasingly been directing its attention, it's less on the current leadership, except to the extent that it has to engage with it, and more on Africa's use. Every year, Beijing is tra training over a thousand up and coming African journalists. It's providing political training, training on the CCP's ideology, its governance structures, its economic development model to over 10,000 uh, future perceived future are African political leaders. So it's playing a very, very long game to ensure that the next generation shares the CCP's conception of the global order and its value system rooted in a kind of collective memory. And I just want to spend a few minutes on that notion of collective memory. It cuts across many dimensions. So the trainings, education, news media, and also cultural institutions, film, TV, music, tech, social media apps like TikTok, for instance, are becoming incredibly popular across most of the African region, particularly in Nigeria, Kenya, Ghana, some other markets. And another sector that interestingly Chinese companies are pushing into uh, in Africa, but also elsewhere is the mobile gaming industry. And if you stick with me for a minute, uh, that there is a there is an interesting point to be made here. Um, in so far as mobile gaming is becoming very popular across the African region as more and more uh, people gain access to mobile communications um, and if you uh, just to, to give an example, so two of the continent's largest uh, gaming markets, Nigeria, South Africa, they're growing by about 30 percent to 2023. And the Chinese are, companies are pushing um, quite aggressively into this. And part of the reason is that the CCP has long objected to the dominance of Western narratives and global discourse, right? Western history, Western mythology, religious symbolism. And especially in the last five years or so, it started to make marked efforts to seize global discursive power, to insert Chinese or rather CCP sanctioned narratives into various international occasions, various international institutions to create what an Oxford professor on a midter, he calls a new kind of a remembering, tells China stories well, spread China's voice well. These are phrases that you start to hear more and more in many of Xi's speeches. And the cultural industries, including gaming, are excellent vehicles for doing exactly that. And I'll maybe just give one, one brief example from within the, the gaming sector in particular. You have developers like Tencent or NetEase. They're developing games that are intended to, and I'll briefly, it's a quote that appeared in, in China Daily back in 12, 2017, quote, inspire Westerners to learn about Chinese history and legends. So you have developers that last year, there was a gaming developer, MiHoYo, that released a game called Genshin Impact. This game has become big on the global gaming stage, also in Africa and Ghana and Nigeria and South Africa. It's based entirely on Chinese mythologies, of course, filtered through the communist lens, and it censors terms. It censors terms like Hong Kong, like Taiwan, like Tibet, other terms that the CCP likely finds objectionable. And so video games and mobile games, they're quickly becoming another tool for Beijing to spread its ideology and its worldview and to do so in quite a subtle way. Uh, the aim of many of these modern games, right, is to create this wholly immersive experience for the players. The players become characters in these fictional worlds. And in that kind of setting, messaging, even or especially of covert messaging, that becomes extremely, extremely powerful. Um, one other quick example, if I may, Chinese television has become quite dominant on the African continent, news media, Xinhua and others, but also 
television shows, films, movies, etc. There's a television show, it's kind of a romantic comedy have become quite a favorite among various East African audiences. It entered the Tanzanian market in 2011, um, and it just expanded throughout the region. It's produced by the Shanghai Media Group, which is China's biggest media and cultural conglomerate. And it just very simply tells the story of a family living in, in urban China. Um, when she visited Tanzania in 2013, he referred to this show, and he said that it would, quote, help Africans learn the joys and sorrows of an ordinary Chinese family, this kind of idea what the German thinker Hans Morgenthau referred to, I think, as strategic empathy. Uh, and the, the numbers on, on these kinds of initiatives, they are, for obvious reasons, a little bit fuzzy. But it's estimated that Beijing has a budget of over 8 billion US dollars just to expand this kind of media presence and cultural presence throughout the African region. So a few years ago, Xinhua shifted its uh, EU uh, Africa network out of its Paris office to Nairobi. And you have other networks that have multiple offices and are broadcasting very widely across the continent. And they're operating with this aim of telling China stories well and changing and shaping the global narrative in the CCP's favor, not only now, but also in the long term with this view to future partnership and future alliances uh, among, among others. And I think the question for those of us here today, you know, and those who believe in the tenets of a uh, liberal democratic world order, however imperfect it may sometimes Sometimes be uh, the question is is what to what to do about that and I'll, I'll maybe pause there having gone on for a little bit um, but that's a little bit from the African continent lots to unpack. <laughs> Alexander, that that was uh, fantastic and fascinating, fantastic, and it's a great segue now to Arthur because on, on two uh, one that we're not going to really talk about now, but uh, one thing you hear about in Ukraine so much is the influence of Russian media, um, and that's been a problem here. But uh, but what but a story that we don't hear uh, is what Arthur has been focused on uh, as the founder of the Free Hong Kong Center. Uh, he was writing a, a book and went to do research in Hong Kong and became captivated by the people there, people like Baggio and Daniel and Simon and, and their passion for liberty and their love for Ukraine and for the Euromaidan revolution. And so, Arthur, if you could, uh, you know, give give us an overview of, of you know, what is um, specifically in Ukraine? What what is China's influence here right now, and what what are uh, Beijing's aims? Um, thank you very much. Good evening, guys from Cave. For a second. Yeah, so um, I just would love to continue what Oxenroom mentioned before about Africa and China. And actually, you know, it's very easily we could take on the example of China and Russia, because I think the biggest colony of China is, of course, Russia. And impact of China on Russia right now is incredible. Like, even from the side of mobile games or TV shows, like China is everywhere in Russia. And once we we're talking about Russia, we, of course, would need to mention Ukraine, because the fight uh, of Ukraine against Russia is a geopolitical fight uh, of the Western world against Russia and China. And uh, right now in Ukraine, we could follow really a lot of corruption scandals connected to China because China is everywhere where Russia is. Like even main Russian TV channels are very related to China, Russian media sharing Chinese narratives and etc. And uh, of course, um, like the biggest threat is uh, security one because, you know, Ukraine is the last gate of Europe to Asian Chinese world. And um, it is very big trouble to us because, for example, in the case of motor siege, the biggest, like, let's say, military uh, factor in Europe, which was tried to be bought by Chinese government. Uh, right now, we could see that Ukraine established sanctions against Wanjin and uh, allies of CCP in this case, um, just after integration of Joe Biden in America. And I think like it's something like good signs Ukraine finally started to fight uh, against Chinese corruption and um, to do some good steps. But from other hand, for example, right now Ukraine is facing extremely big corruption scandal over Shinovac vaccine from coronavirus. Because, you know, like it is the biggest scandal in the world. Like we could compare cases of Ukraine and Philippines, but let's say Philippines is not a democracy or so far due to their own regime. But Ukraine is a democracy and we are facing different challenges. And um, since, you know, in Ukrainian Minister of Health bought in a legal way Shinovac vaccine, and told that uh, this corrupted schemes was proposed by actually Shinovac. So that means that right now Ukraine could be the biggest epicenter of um, 
Chinese vaccine corruption scandal, what is making a lot of troubles to CCP. And uh, as far as you know, like China uh, is extremely mad. They're pressing a lot our government. And just two weeks ago, the ambassador of Ukraine in China was eventually died. Uh, from heart attack, but without no facts what happened to him. And from my sources, I know that it was very big pressure from CCP on him to solve all these corruption issues and to whitewash China in Ukraine. Arthur, if you could tell, what, what was the corruption regarding the vaccine? What, 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 what was the, what, what's the problem as you see it? Mm-hmm. So, firstly, it was like a situation that Ukrainian government did very bad in the case of communication with Western um, farm companies. But uh, they thought, okay, we will not go ahead with, with the best. We will go to China and to talk about Sinovac. And Ukraine was one of the more first countries in the world bought Sinovac and paid, prepaid it uh, with very high price. Like, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's something like uh, 13 or $18 per. Uh, uh, one dose, but like it's a very high price actually for this shit. Uh, and uh, the problem is that uh, it was bought via proxy firm of Raisa Bakhtaryova, who was the head of Security Council of Yanukovych regime and also ex Minister of Health, extremely related to Kremlin. And this proxy firm told that um, actually all these price issues and all these contracts between Ukraine and China should be via proxy just because uh, China told to do it via this corrupted proxy of Raisa Bakhtarova, who is extremely related to Yanukovych, who was a dictator of Ukraine during the revolution of dignity times. So um, it's very, very complicated. But what we could say so far is that um, China is trying to be everywhere in healthcare uh, sphere. And the last Last report of Estonian uh, intelligence forces they just uh, proven that everything is so bad because it's the very first time when our region started to speak up um, about Chinese influence and told that China is the biggest threat to the world, not Russia. Well, and, and Arthur, I've heard and I've read, I've read uh, your words on this, but you refer to Russia and China as the the red hydra, like the, the two sided, yeah. uh, two faced red hydra. Uh, and if you explain that idea, but then why? What do they want from Ukraine? Why, you know, why? What, what, what does Ukraine offer that that they want so so much? If that is what, if if they do want something from from Ukraine. Well, Ukraine is the biggest country of Europe. We should always remember it. And it's a very strong one. Like, we have a lot of, um, like, let's say, infrastructure, infrastructure, technical, military heritage from uh, Soviet Union, the same one as Russia has, but right now is more developed because of the war on the East. Um, and also, from other hand, Ukraine is, let's, uh, as I told before, is a gate to the West. So probably once China is there, first of all, it could, um, you know, steal some information from our military factories or our different security objects. From other hand, they always could show to the world that, well, Ukraine is a country where we are presented. So from Ukraine, we could go to our regional countries near the European Union, because let's say Poland right now is facing democracy crisis. Hungary is facing extremely huge democracy crisis. And let's say Balkan region, which is also very important to China, because China tried first to impact, for example, Bulgaria strong but it was kicked out by a force of joint force of NATO and European Union. So um, for China, Ukraine is something like very big proxy um, territory where they could gain really a lot. And of course, uh, the last point and core one, agriculture. You know, Ukraine is agricultural leader of the world, probably one of them among them. And uh, China is extremely, extremely aggressive. Just imagine that as a head of Chinese diaspora in Ukraine is the owner of the majority of agricultural firms in uh, Kharkiv region and uh, like he's very aggressive and very connected to, for example with Russian oligarchs well thanks and I uh, I want to as, uh, for, for our last segment uh, I will uh, I'd like for you guys to ask each other questions because I think you have a lot of you know I think you can extract some great information and you know the right questions to ask and maybe I'll, I'll start that though with uh, say Baggio or Daniel or Simon, maybe one of you could say to someone sitting a Ukrainian in Ukraine, you know, saying, you know, uh, you know, hearing Arthur talk about China or, or someone sitting in, in Nairobi or even in, in, in the United States, uh, based on your experience closely with, with the regi- regime of Beijing, 
you know, should we be caring about these things? Should we be alert to these things? And, and you know, what's your advice to us? Should I go first? Please, Bajil, yeah. Okay. Uh, I would say that um, basically we can see the case from Africa, from Ukraine, from everywhere among the world that to struggle your country with your own system, that is what CCP doing. They are using other countries. Wait, no, sorry, sorry, Bajil, can, 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 you, can you say that again? To struggle CCP your says with your own system. This is what CCP mm -hmm. is doing. And they are using other countries' system to twist things around, to cause chaos, to mess things up, and to, to use it against them. When you believe in free speech, they will do protests in your backyard to call you out. When you believe in free press, they will establish or to finance a media and use those medias to lie to your population, to spread their, their propaganda, including uh, not only medias, maybe like in Africa, they, they do game uh, they do it in the game industry, but similar um, logic. When you believe in free market, they will bring state grant or state support companies that can sell at a low cost to put your company in some industry out of business. This is what they do. And of course, the free world need to be aware of this. And more importantly, we should act now to stop the silent invasion. The modern, the modern war is not about sending tanks and soldiers to, to, to another uh, country and try to do, do an invasion. This is not. But this is like you can do it politically, you can do it economically, and you can do it in, in your daily life. So we should act now before it is too late and don't follow the track of Hong Kong or state, I would say. In Hong Kong, uh, most of our uh, uh, companies that that related to our daily life is greatly controlled by by the Beijing government right now, and, and China is not only a problem for Hong Kong, not just for Asia, but a looming threat to the international order. You can see, and democracy everywhere, from the denial responsibility for the COVID nineteen pandemic to bullying other country like. Uh, 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 Australia, Canada, they all show that the free world leadership role in confronting that the China problem has never been more important. I want to echo. Uh, yeah. Oh, maybe a Simon after you. Sorry, after you. Simon. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to ask a question um, to Alex Sandra. Um, because I'm so impressed um, that uh, Alex Sandra has a very great knowledge and sense of the propaganda. Um, which the CCP running around the world. Um, why is because that um, I have been one of the victims by the propaganda machine. I have been broadcast my enforced confection videotapes through CGTN. So I fly the compla complaint to Ofcom in the UK. And finally, I'm so glad to see Ofcom decide to revoke the license of the CGTN in London. Um, we're not sure what's the next destination, um, but at least that would be quite significant so far because um, in London, that would be the European headquarters. And I also can see, um, for example, when I um, study at LC in London with Danny, we, we, we saw quite a lot of the students and even some of the teachers, they have lots of relations with Chinese embassy or the funding from the Confucius Institute and then they try to reshape the dialogues and try to match with you know to justify why China is democratic country and I'm not sure just one of the question is that would you feel after the protests in Hong Kong we can see seems like at least the West and you know democratic countries they seems like waking up and what you feel now um, the the propaganda campaign is like a little bit declining of the CCP and what do you feel in the future whether that they were back on the water? Because a few days ago, I watched the news from Guardian. It seems like Boy Johnson uh, in Downing Street, they have the uh, pro-China business groups meeting and said, you know, they wanted to uh, relaunch the dialogue in terms of economic trade and et cetera. So I'm not sure what, what, what you feel in the future about this. 
Yeah, that's a it's a interesting point. And also here in in Western Europe, you had the EU recently signing the uh, China investment agreement, also opening doors, kind of largely spearheaded by by Germany in that context, with France also backing, spearheading, uh, opening the door to significant investment. And you know, also you know, I, I lecture at several universities here, and the um, Chinese influence is also quite strongly felt from an ideological perspective. So I actually personally don't see the propaganda machine slowing down, at least not from my perspective. I, I see maybe it becoming um, a little bit more embedded in various systems and institutions that make it more difficult to identify if you don't know what you're mm -hmm. looking for. Um, but I wouldn't say that it's necessarily slowing down. And I mean, I, arguably, you can speak to it better than I can to some extent with the aims of uh, the CCP, its long term policy goals. I, I think uh, Bajo re referred to you referred to this in your remarks as well. I think we need to realize that, you know, when we speak about China, sometimes we speak about economic competition or technological competition or whatever it might be. But I think we need to be quite clear that it's also a struggle of ideas that we're we're in. This is this is an ideological kind of struggle and ideological warfare. So not boots on the ground, um, but a different kind of mentality that we have to adopt. Um, Speaking from the African region, just to circle back there, the propaganda machine is is incredibly incredibly strong and penetrates. You know, I, I really just kind of scratched the surface, and there it's a little bit more uh, difficult to push back, even if citizens are in genre that don't necessarily uh, kind of propaganda to the fore or highlight it as as problematic because in some cases it benefits the governments in power as well uh so it's it's a very difficult um a very difficult issue to to tackle and unpack but i personally see it strengthening not not um not waning anytime soon um I I, thank you I do have some of the following questions as well. Uh, one is to Alexandra as well, and another one would be over uh, specific about Europe. Uh, so um, let me give you a, like a little bit heads up here because what we have witnessed in this year long, 2020, right? Um, what is the biggest issue in in the last year, 2020? That would be COVID-19, uh, undeniably. But where we actually talk about COVID-19, I would say this is not only about a global health or epidemic issue. This is a political issue. This is politics. Well, when the um, when the coronavirus first broke up in Wuhan as early, probably in November 2019, what the CCP does, they try, they did not try to contain the virus. They contain the people. They control the dissemination of the information. They arrest the whistleblowers, the nurses, and doctors as well. Actually, what this actually happened to Hong Kongers back in 2003 during the SARS pandemic. Uh, that took away more uh, about 299 Hong Kongers life at a time. Also because China was not able to con uh, was not able uh, to you know to try to be transparent in terms of the virus information. But they just control everything here. They did not learn from mistake and now they sweep, uh, the virus swept across the globe in this country alone in the United States, there has been more than 200,000 people lost their life because of COVID-19, way more than the First World War, Second World War, and Vietnam combined here. But like, you know what we have seen here, I have to say, um, what happened in Hong Kong in 2019 and what, Hong Kong, what happened to the world in 2020, is, I think it's, it's, it has been a process. And I feel like the world has been awakening towards the Chinese flag. What uh, sometimes when I was doing my advocacy work with Baggio or with other like many editors, I was telling the biggest problem that we are seeing is would not be a domestic problem. The biggest threat to humanity would be the Chinese Communist Party. But I want to know, especially uh, to uh, Alexandra, because uh, also in echo with what Baggio said about uh, Chinese ethnic statecraft as demonstrated in the Barrett Road Initiative. Do you think this year onwards, there will be more and more, you know, multilateral effort towards the CCP, especially with the new administration? Uh, this is my question to Alexandra. And my follow-up question to offer, uh, I would uh, ask in one go here. Like, you know, I think in Europe, as you mentioned, that EU is trying, uh, you know, some of them, uh, some members in within EU parliament, they do want to sign their 
trade agreement with China. But what we are seeing here, because uh, what Hong Kong we also learned from the Ukrainian revolution uh, back in 2014, early 2014, and a lot, I feel like Ukraine is waking up, especially, you know, a lot of Eastern European countries who has been suppressed by Soviet Union at the time, they stood alongside Hong Kong, especially the border states here. Do you think at some point, like, you know, some sort of these, like, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, Eastern European nations or even Scandinavian countries could make a change for uh, 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 influencing the other EU member states as well in seeing what is the common enemy as well? So these would be my two questions. Thank you. Do you like to go first, Arthur? <laughs> Do you want to go first, Arthur? <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. Uh, I mean, like, you know, please, please, please oh, okay. go, go first. Please yeah, go. I'm just... Ah, okay. Sorry, please, because like I, I don't know, like my mic was on and like I was surprised. Yeah, uh, I'm trying to be sure, quite quite short in these um, frames. Like you know, European Union is very complicated, um, but a very beautiful um, platform t in our region. And the problem is that like we are very different. But uh, talking about Eastern Europe and Eastern European nations, of course, we are much more uh, vaccinated from Soviet virus and communist virus that, for example, Western Europeans. And I think like the biggest trouble, uh, like not actually in Eastern Europe or even in Scandinavia, but of course in the, let's say, you know, like the most western part of Europe, like in France, maybe somewhere in Spain, Italy, Greece, countries where um, people are very used to left ideas, let's say, and they're very um, like easily taking everything from socialist societies, especially France. France is a very big problem because, um, you know, it's like even Macron, he's very, very um, sympathetic to Putin. He is very, very sympathetic to Xi Jinping. And even what we have seen at the last um, Munich security conference, like Macron just told that like, okay, we have a true, like something like seems to be treated from China, but uh, like, let's say it's not like a very clear message to Europe or to the world. So uh, we need to really work to, to, with France to make them understand that like uh, China is a problem. But talking about uh, Eastern Europe, I think like um, we are quite, quite strong enough to, to make other part of Europe understand that China is just a second Soviet Union. Not more, not less. Yeah, maybe quickly picking up uh, a little bit of, of Arthur's thinking to, to answer your question, Daniel, as well. Um, in terms of uh, Western Europe, it's an uh, interesting discussion that happens here between the economic trade-offs and the, uh, let's say, more ideological normative issues that, that surround China. And depending on who you talk to, people fall on different different sides on that aisle, as, as Arthur mentioned. I think France is a problem. I would also potentially put Germany in, the, in that bucket um, as well. And so in terms of uh, multilateral efforts, I think the answer is, is yes and no. Um, no, for the reason that some are still going to put the economics before the, the normative uh, questions that we're discussing here today, unfortunately. Um, but yes, in the sense that, uh, as you mentioned, there is a steady awakening. Um, and I think that that awakening is happening, though, in regions that previously were not part of the traditional Western multilateral alliance. So moving away a little bit from traditional Western European allies and looking, for instance, to Australia, looking to India, looking to South Korea, looking to Japan, the so-called quad that has emerged. And I think that working in concert with to, to the United States under the Biden administration, and he's putting quite uh, significant emphasis early on on emphasizing democracy and emphasizing human rights um, as quite a cornerstone of the foreign policy agenda. I think there, there will be a bit of a coalescence, but it won't come from where we have traditionally seen it come from uh, before. So it'll take a little bit of time to emerge, but I very much hope that it will emerge because I, I agree with what's been said here. It's, it's one of the biggest uh, threats that we're facing at the moment uh, as a global community. Thank you very much. Thanks, Daniel. Well, uh, yeah, th thank you. Uh, for, uh, that was a great kind of concluding uh, question and answer. I know we, we could continue talking about this for, for much longer, and I hope we will continue uh, in multiple capacities. And uh, what an honor to bring all, all of you people together, uh, people that have lived through this in different ways, uh, most intensely uh, you Hong Kongers. And, um, and just a quick thing before we go, but are you guys, are your families okay? Are you, I mean, how are you guys, how are you holding up? How are you doing? Well, I can say first, um, 
Um, I, I actually cut tight uh, with my family due to the uh, security concern um, because I am still active and vocal internationally. So um, based on the back track record of the CCP, what's one of the examples we can raise is like Liu Xiaobo and quite many dissidents, even in mainland China. They would use their family members as their hostage. And for example, like to me, I even I, I flagged and le I left Hong Kong and I maintained basic communication with my families in Hong Kong. But after a few months, when the first time I start to receive the interview with the Cantonese and Chinese media, and my you know my family members gave me a call, and they never ever you know admit that you know I asked him I asked them whether you have some someone approach you, and then they said you know uh, if so what can you help us? So I understood that you know better uh, to live it. Um, so. I just wanted to make sure that the secret police that uh, they can't find any way to convey any message to me anymore. So that's the things I, I I have to make this tough decision. Well, well, man, and, and commendations to you guys. I mean, I think you know, as I walk these streets uh, of Lviv, uh, you know, recalling the history of you know 30, 40, 50 years ago, where people lived in that type of fear, and to know that it. It still exists, and, and it's still it's a growing threat. Uh, and so we will uh, we'll continue talking. We're we're going to package this into a podcast uh, to to share this, and because it's such a great conversation. So if you'll please follow us, uh, follow the Lviv Lab on Facebook. And Karen from Georgetown has put that in the in the chat. Um, and I like to thank um, Dean Vladimir Turchinovsky uh, of the Ukrainian Catholic University and all the team uh, for for letting us uh, have this conversation. And uh, and we will also this was also broadcast on YouTube and we'll continue sharing it um, across all of our platforms. And so many thanks to uh, Arthur in Kiev, uh, Daniel and Baggio in Washington, Simon in London and Alexandra and you're in Geneva, right? It's Geneva, right? Zurich. In Zurich. Correct. Okay, I was going to say Zurich, but in Zurich. Sorry, Zurich. I knew I had it wrong. But <laughs> thanks to Alexandra in Zurich and. Uh, and with that, um, I will uh, yeah, tr truly many thanks. And let's also we'll thank Melanie, who's already off the call. But for that, uh, let's not forget about that that that, that situation in uh, in Odessa um, with uh, with Sergei. So anyway, many thanks to you all, and uh, uh, good night. How would you guys say goodbye in, uh, in 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 Hong Kong? Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, you know, in your language. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Don't provide you for Ukraine. Good night. Thank you. Yeah.